Hi everyone, thank you for joining us. Today's video is going to be a continuation of our last video, Why Hire an Immigration Lawyer? So an obvious consideration when first hiring a lawyer is referrals and references. So Colin, what are your initial thoughts? So in the immigration field, typically practitioners are independent practicing lawyers. It's very rare that you're going to have lawyers in the large law firms. Uh, large law firms don't include uh, immigration as one of their specialties. That's most of the time. Uh, occasionally there are a couple of firms that have small practices in the immigration field. Um, so references and referrals is obviously the best source uh, that one could look to in choosing an immigration lawyer. Um, and looking at friends and family uh, members who have had good experiences with an immigration lawyer um, is probably the best way to go. Obviously, if you have uh, someone who's worked with a firm and they're very happy with the services, that is probably the beginning stages. If you have that option, that obviously is a very good start. Okay, and how important is specialization? So, it's important for people to understand the rules in immigration change literally multiple times a week. It's some province, uh, whether it's permanent residence or sponsorship is a separate policy. Uh, working in Canada is uh, covered by many policies. So you want to be working with someone who does this area, practices this area day in and day out because you need to be able to, uh, you need to be aware of all these changes because any of them could affect uh, your project to Canada. So working with someone uh, who is specialized in the area and typically what we like to see, uh, what we recommend, what we, what we would uh, suggest is uh, an experienced uh, practitioner is one who's been doing this for at least five to ten years. Uh, under that it really doesn't give you uh, the full broad perspective whether it's business cases, uh, you just need to have, and some of these cases take uh, a long time to conclude. So if someone's practicing two, three years, you really haven't seen, uh, unless your practice is focused only on one specific area of the law, you haven't really had that much of experience in seeing variances and, and issues that are common. Let's, that's for a business case. Um, Again, in the, in, the, in the work permit stage, things are a, a, a quite a bit faster. Um, so it's, it's really a, a question of looking uh, to have someone representing you that has a minimum of in the range of five to ten years of experience. Okay. So Colin, what should a potential applicant look for when signing a contract? So obviously the contract is, is really the details of what is the nature of the case, uh, what category. Um, and all of the licensing requirements with respect to lawyers, um, they, they require uh, the lawyer to specify in a written mandate uh, what I the nature of the service is going to be in, in terms of uh, providing uh, uh, the guidance and, and it has to be stated in writing. Uh, so you want to look for uh, a really detailed contract. Obviously uh, it has to be uh, long enough and, and comprehensive enough on the one hand, but on the other hand, you don't want to see uh, you know, a 20-page agreement. That, that becomes uh, quite um, uh, non-beneficial to anyone because you can't, you can't be that specific on all the outcomes that could happen. There's a lot of unknown variables. Um, so you want the, the terms and conditions to be clear, concise, and of course, as I said earlier, it needs to be in writing. Okay. And what should an applicant look for when obtaining an initial assessment? So this is an area that's, that's interesting in terms of those who are applying for admission to Canada from, uh, from the point of view they want to establish permanently in Canada. Um, it's very common that, that firms will render an assessment. Uh, it's very important that if you're looking uh, to immigrate to Canada and you're filling out an assessment form, uh, you want to be working with a firm that's doing this at no charge. I if you're going to work with a professional, obviously you want to deal with a professional that works in this space on a full-time basis. 
And if they're charging you a fee for an assessment, that, that's a, a, a signal that this is not their main area and they rely on the revenue just to render an assessment. They're, they have an hourly rate mentality a, of a lawyer, which typically law firms will charge by the hour. So uh, they want to account for every hour uh, that, their, that their lawyers are, are, are spending on a particular uh, part of their day. Uh, you don't want to work with a, a, an entity that's charging you a fee. On the other hand, <coughs> the the assessment cannot include, uh, and you, you shouldn't have an expectation that the assessment will give you all your points, for example, because uh, there's a limit to a, uh, what a lawyer can predict in the future. For example, uh, if you don't have your education uh, straight, you know, if you don't have your education results uh, verified by Canadian authorities, or, for example, if your English language or French language abilities are not uh, confirmed in writing by uh, the uh, evaluating entity, what you're receiving is just um, uh, an unverified, non-committing uh, uh, assessment, and it's predicting something that you don't really have. So this is engaging in speculation. Uh, there are a lot of firms that try to give you your points, which I feel, in my opinion, um, is not a good practice. Because unless you have the person's English skill uh, results uh, in hand, you can't predict what a person is going to score. A and I suppose you could uh, uh, qualify that you could say to a candidate, if you receive this score in English, this is what your points will be. But expecting a firm to actually lay out uh, all the points and what your score is, uh, that is a bit uh, m more than uh, reasonable in rendering an opinion. Uh, it, is, it is reasonable if a, a professional looks at your background and then confirms you are qualified. Uh, a lot of firms will have a contractual uh, writing which says the first stage of the uh, work to be done is confirming your assessment. So uh, that uh, in itself should not be done for free. Uh, one should not expect a lawyer to render an assessment uh, which gives you your full, that, that's part of what a lawyer does and that should not be done for free. So there's a fine line of expectation on the part of a candidate uh, when they're getting an online form for no charge, uh, an assessment for no charge. Um, there should be a, a reasonable expectation uh, in terms of what the lawyer is providing at no charge. Okay, what about advertisements? How can advertisements be misleading? So a lot of uh, firms, uh, practitioners, uh, will promote their services using advertising. And as a consumer, you should be aware that advertising obviously can be misleading. Uh, so you need to uh, just understand that you want to go further than just looking at a print ad. Uh, of course, it's, it's common for people to see an advertising uh, online or, or in print. Uh, and one should be careful uh, and go further than just using uh, one print uh, online or uh, a, a, a continued repetitive uh, print uh, program by a practitioner. You should go further and extend uh, your search beyond one uh, advertising uh, element that you see online or in the print medium. It's important and it's, it's to your benefit to go further than that. Okay, thank you. So Colin, what should applicants look for when seeking out a lawyer online? So we generally would suggest uh, that when you're going to find the uh, potential lawyer that you want to work with, you want to check that they have a pretty comprehensive website. Uh, content is king in the industry. Um, in the sense that uh, where there's regular content, um, it will give uh, uh, an affirmation of their knowledge and uh, broad experience in a particular field. Uh, what you don't want is uh, websites that have very general information, clearly copied from government websites. Um, having uh, analysis, uh, of course you want the website in question to have the content that is the basic requirements for all the different policies and, and, and programs. But understanding those policies and programs and sharing insight 
uh, on how these um, elements are, are uh, interpreted and such, uh, I think that's, that's really uh, very important. You, you want to stay clear of firms that, that are just putting very basic information. Obviously, you also want to see firms that have a free assessment um, and such. So you really want to work with an entity that gives you confidence that they are in the know. Uh, social media is also very good to, uh, to be looking at. Be careful with social media because a lot of social media you can buy content followers. It's very easy to do. Uh, it's it's maybe difficult for the ordinary consumer to tell the difference between uh, organic traffic and paid for traffic. There are some firms who go to great lengths in uh, conveying or trying to convey they have a large social media following when in fact it's so uh, evident that they're buying uh, followers. So uh, it may be difficult for the ordinary consumer to, to, to see this. One area that you can see this is LinkedIn. It's very hard to buy LinkedIn followers. So if you're going to look at a professional and work with a professional, you want to look and compare the following on LinkedIn because that is an area that you have very hard. It's very costly to buy followers on LinkedIn. Uh, Facebook you can buy very cheaply. Instagram you can buy very cheaply. Uh, so it's really important to look at firms that uh, have strong internet uh, social media on start with LinkedIn. That alone will be a giveaway uh, to you that their following is legitimate. Uh, when you're going to compare if that's, if that's an important element to you. So all in all, those are the important considerations uh, when you're searching firms online. Okay, so that brings us to the next question. What's the importance of lawyers and publications? So this is a real tall tale sign of, of a, a practitioner who's committed to the profession uh, and is really uh, in the know. Uh, there are a few uh, major legal publications in Canada. Uh, LexisNexis is one, uh, Thomson Reuters is another. The really uh, uh, involved lawyers uh, who are in the uh, academic side of things are regularly publishing in industry-wide, industry-recognized legal publications. There are uh, practitioners who have content, uh, but you will not find them uh, in any major publication. Uh, so it's really important if you're looking for the uh, validity of a particular practitioner versus hiring an entrepreneur or practitioner. If, if you're an entrepreneur practitioner, chances are you're not really publishing in legal journals. You don't have that academic side to you. Uh, you want to work with a professional that is more than just an entrepreneur. You want to work with a professional who is recognized by the leading industry publications and they're not publishing you know occasionally but they're publishing regularly this will really convey uh, in my opinion uh, uh, that you could be on, on better footing with your choice of working with that professional okay so what's the importance of a professional membership such as the Canadian Bar Association so that's another area that you can uh, use as a, 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 it's another factor in determining whether the professional you want to work with uh, is really in the know and has the respect of the industry itself, the practitioners in the industry. Um, if you are an involved practitioner, you will have served in the, uh, the entity called the Canadian Bar Association or of a province. Uh, they all have immigration sections. A really uh, non-entrepreneurial but committed academic professional uh, will put in the time and give back to the community of the industry by being an executive member and these are usually years of involvement so you might start off you know there's it there they all work the same way so working with a professional who served uh, in the professional organizations which the community of practitioners recognize it's, it's, it's another factor in working with a professional versus many professionals who 
have never served on uh, these professional bodies, whether it's Canadian bar. You can be a member of the Canadian Bar Association, for example, and never have served in an executive capacity, uh, which the peers in the industry, your peers, will, will recognize uh, by uh, agreeing to have you sit on different boards and membership uh, entities. So again, look to people who have served previously or are currently serving in professional organizations. Okay, so that brings us to what the importance of a licensing order is. Well, clearly you can't be a lawyer unless you're a member of a professional order. So that is uh, a mandatory requirement. You can't call yourself a lawyer unless you are a member of a licensed professional uh, lawyer's uh, body. So always work with a licensed professional in terms of being a lawyer. You can verify that they are currently in good standing. All of the provincial, all of the provincial law societies will allow the consumer to verify that the lawyer in question is in good standing, no complaints outstanding, etc. So, but being a member, of course, of a professional provincial law society does not in itself convey any expertise. So first off, you want to make sure that the lawyer is a member in good standing of a licensed professional order in Canada. And second of all, all the other factors that I've already covered. Great. So finally, let's expand on direct communications. So I mean, that is a really final uh, element to your search for working with a competent, experienced immigration lawyer. Uh, all said and done, you need to be speaking on the phone with the firm. You have to have, uh, obviously, you have to, you know, there's a lot of fraud in this industry. And there's a lot of warnings being put out by government. Uh, we receive uh, very often, uh, m countless times a week, where entities uh, are promoting services. Um, there's a lot of fraud going on in such that the way to minimize your risks of working with an improper or an unlawful professional uh, that's claiming membership in a professional body is to actually get on the phone, make sure that the website has the phone number, make sure there's an email address that's linked, uh, you know, that, that is clearly the, 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 the professional's website. Phone call, discussion on phone gives the uh, consumer much more uh, reassurance that uh, they're going to understand the process. Uh, after the phone call, of course, everything should be set in writing and the writing should match with what was discussed on the phone. So even if you're obviously many applicants are from overseas, uh, the cost of, of a phone call is, is, is almost free if you, uh, it, it can be free in most instances if you are uh, savvy enough to know whether it's uh, subscribing to uh, internet services uh, where phone calls are free uh, or very very low cost if it's Skype or whatever you're using so always best to make sure you've spoken to the professional the, the goal here is to minimize the incidence of disappointment great thank you very much Colin and if you'd like to find out if you qualify for immigration to Canada, please go to our website, immigration.ca, and complete our free online evaluation form. And as always, please like us and follow us on our social media, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. And we'll keep you posted for the next date of our video. Very much so. It looks to be in mid-October around this time. Uh, we'll surely keep you informed. Thank you so much for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you.